Okay, so uh, welcome to this fourth video on calcium waves. So, this is really the crux of calcium signalling. This is the grown-up version of calci calcium signalling. Uh, you know, when you were a first-year medical student, you learnt these um, hetero, you know, you learnt this GQ pathway. And you learnt, you know, that IP3 stimulates the IP3 receptor, that causes calcium to go up in the cytoplasm. Well, what I'm now telling you is that when you stimulate these um, GQ pathways, what you get is these calcium waves that propagate through cells. And the intensity of your stimulus, i.e. how much, um, in this case, phenylephrine you put onto your cell to stimulate uh, this uh, GQ pathway, and that, that will determine how much IP3 you have within your cytoplasm, that determines how frequently these calcium waves uh, propagate through the cell, it, rather than determining uh, how high uh, the calcium level gets within the cell, which is the, what you would have guessed if you were using your immature understanding of calcium signaling. So this is a better a better way of doing it for the cell, as I explained in the previous video, because if we were just having an analogue signal of calcium level in the cytoplasm um, was um, was um, that that level was determined by the um, the intensity of the stimulus, then you could potentially get to levels of calcium which are very toxic for the cell. So it's better to communicate intensity of the stimulus through this um, frequency of um, calcium waves. Okay, so in this video, what I want to do is look at some of the experimental evidence for this. Just a few little experiments that are associated with this, basically. Okay, so uh, let me get another piece of paper and we'll do that. Okay, so we're going to look at um, an experiment that was done in hex cells, basically. So I'm going to tell you what a hex cell is, firstly. So a hex cell. Uh, and basically, a hex cell stands for human embryonic kidney cell. So it's a, a cell. It's a cell line that a lot of experiments are done on. Uh, and basically, what you can do is you can put into uh, your hex cell, your human embryonic kidney cell, uh, whichever proteins you choose. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our hex cell. So I'll draw our hex cell here, and we are going to put in the protein. Uh, just to mix things up a bit, we'll do uh, a muscarinic receptor. Um, so we could have put in the same one that we had last time. We could have put in alpha-1 again, but we'll um, practice our pharmacology. So we'll um, look at a muscarinic receptor here. So let's say it's the M1 muscarinic receptor, which is a receptor for acetylcholine. Okay, and we will stimulate it with an agonist for muscarinic receptors, uh, namely mefacholine. So I'll just show you the structure of mefacholine, uh, like I did for uh, phenylephrine. And I'll compare and contrast it again to acetylcholine. So mefacholine then. So uh, mefacholine has this structure. It has an acetyl group like so. And I hope it's going to fit in here. Acetyl group like so. And then down here... It has uh, two carbons coming off like so, uh, and off this carbon here, and this is what gives it its name, it has a methyl group. That's why it's called mefacholine, because of this methyl group that you have here. And then off this carbon you have two hydrogens, and then finally you have a, I'll bring this into the, more into the centre, uh, you have a nitrogen bonded to three methyl groups. Okay, and that gives the nitrogen a positive charge because basically it's forged one more bond than it wanted to do and it's given up both of its electrons to this carbon here. Okay, um, well it shared both of its electrons with the carbon, so this bond, one of these bonds, both of the electrons were given by the nitrogen rather than one from the nitrogen and one from the carbon. Okay, so this is methacholine, now let's compare and contrast that to acetylcholine, which is the endogenous agonist for uh, an M1 acetylcholine receptor. Okay, so um, here is, again, you have this acetyl group, so this is shared by acetylcholine and mefacholine. Then you have, um, from the acetyl group, you then have 
two carbons again, but you don't have that methyl group, and that's why this is called methacholine, because basically it's just acetylcholine with an extra methyl group. And then everything else is just the same. So this nitrogen, again, has three methyl groups coming off it and a positive charge. Okay, so that's acetylcholine. Right, so, methacholine basically is a non-selective agonist for muscarinic acid, excuse me, for muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. So, it likes muscarinic uh, acetylcholine receptors, and it will bind to them and stimulate them. And M1 is a type of muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. So, basically, if we um, have our hex cells, which we've transfected uh, with M1 receptors, and we douse them in methacholine, it's going to stimulate this receptor. Now, this receptor is coupled to the GQ pathway. So, just like uh, the alpha-1 receptor, it's going to lead, basically, to IP3 levels going up in the cytoplasm. And how much by which IP3 goes up in the cytoplasm will be determined by the concentration of methacholine that you put in the extracellular fluid, basically. Okay, so what we now know is IP3 is going to induce these calcium waves in this hex cell just like it did in the hepatocyte. So we're going to get calcium waves basically propagating across this hex cell. Okay, and the frequency of calcium waves that we get will be determined by um, how high the IP3 concentration is within the cytoplasm, which in turn will be con um, controlled by um, how much methacholine you've put in the extracellular fluid. Okay, so an important experiment that we can now do into uh, calcium waves is we can see what happens if we remove all calcium from the extracellular fluid. So we've got our hex cell. It's in, you know, a little Petri dish, and it's sitting in a fluid that we can control the consistency of or the, um, we can certainly control the concentration of calcium in that extracellular fluid. So what if we remove all extracellular calcium? Well, basically, what you see is the calcium waves happen for a while. So if I was to um, plot calcium concentration at a specific point, so understand what I'm doing now. Uh, I'm not plotting one of these calcium wave graphs. Instead, I am going to a specific point of my cell here, and I am plotting calcium concentration. Okay, so I am measuring calcium at that point, and I want to look at how does that calcium concentration vary with time. Well, let's think about what we're going to see, or at least what we'd expect to see. In fact, let's start off with there is calcium in the extracellular fluid. Let's draw the graph for that, and then let's see what happens when there's no calcium in the extracellular fluid. So if there's calcium in the extracellular fluid, then we would expect calcium waves to happen as usual. So, uh, what's going to happen is that calcium might go up first over here. It's going to go boom, 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 boom. Calcium concentration, um, these calcium spikes, these rises in calcium concentration are going to propagate forward and they're going to get to this point. So, what you would expect to see is a rise and then a fall in calcium concentration. Now, you don't just get one calcium wave, you get another one. So, uh, what's going to happen is there's going to be a short interlude, and then you're going to get another calcium spike, which is a second calcium wave propagating along this cell. And the frequency, the time difference between these two uh, waves is going to be determined by how much IP3 you've got in your cytoplasm, which in turn is determined by how much methacholine you've stimulated your hex cell with. Okay, so you're going to get these continual calcium oscillations at your uh, point of interest. Right, now, let's do the same experiment, but now we've removed the extracellular calcium. So calcium that has now gone from the extracellular environment. Okay, so there's no calcium anymore in the extracellular fluid. We've removed it. What's going to happen now? Well, um... What uh, initially what happens is you get calcium waves. So initially, what's going to happen is exactly the same. Calcium will the, what calcium wave will get here, and calcium will go up and down. Now, what happens? You then get an interlude, and then the next calcium wave comes along. 
but the calcium peak that you get is sort of slightly lower and then the next interlude and then again the calcium goes up but they're gradually tailing off and eventually they'll just stop now why is that what happens basically is um, if we think about what's happening in the calcium wave you're releasing calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum each time so each time you get a calcium wave what's happening is at each point along this endoplasmic reticulum, you're releasing the calcium into the cytoplasm through the IP3 receptor. Okay? Now, gradually what will happen is you will deplete the calcium that is stored within the endoplasmic reticulum. It will be going into the cytoplasm. Now, there is a pump, there is a pump known as the sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase, or CIRCA for short, which is pumping calcium back into the endoplasmic reticulum. It pumps two calciums in and three protons out, and every time it does that, it hydrolyzes ATP. So ATP is going to go to ADP, ATP to ADP in inorganic phosphate. Um, and it does, it tries its best to return the calcium into the endoplasmic reticulum. It's got a, a capacity of around 5,000 calcium ions per second. Um, but it's, um, it is slow. Um, in fact, I don't know if it, it does have a concept, it does have a capacity of 5,000 calcium ions a second. I think it might be much lower than that. Um, forget that. Um, okay, so um, Circa tries its best. It returns the cal a bit of calcium into the endoplasmic reticulum, but there are also mechanisms in the cell uh, membrane for removing calcium. So when calcium goes up in the cytoplasm, there are basically you just want to get rid of that calcium. Uh, and one of the ways is that it's pumped back into the endoplasmic reticulum. But another way is that you've got a plasma membrane calcium ATPase, which basically uses ATP to extrude a single calcium ion. So for every ATP that's hydrolyzed, a single calcium is moved out, basically. Okay, there's also uh, the sodium uh, calcium exchanger, uh, which I'll draw here the NCX, the sodium calcium exchanger, which is going to um, bring in free sodiums here um, and extrude um, extrude a single calcium out here. Okay, so um, these two proteins, the plasma membrane associated calcium ATPase and the sodium calcium exchanger here, those are removing, extruding calcium from uh, the cytoplasm and the pr uh, play, uh, plasma membrane associated calcium ATPase has a capacity of around 150 calcium ions a second and the sodium calcium exchanger has a capacity I think of around 5,000 calcium ions per second. So I think Circa actually has a capacity closer to PMCA than it does to um, NCX. Uh, so basically, you are removing calcium from your cytoplasm. So the calcium that was released from the endoplasmic reticulum is being thrown out of the cell. Some of it will be going back into the, uh, into the endoplasmic reticulum through the circa pump, but some of it will be being extruded through these um, two proteins here. So, what's gradually going to happen is the amount of calcium in this, um, in this endoplasmic reticulum is going to go down and down and down because gradually it's all going to be extruded into the extracellular fluid. And, you know, this cell is sitting in a whole Petri dish. So, if I draw a picture, this is the Petri dish. The cell is but a speck on here. So, when it's throwing its calcium out into this dish, the calcium goes off into the whole Petri dish, and that cell is never going to see that calcium again. So, you've got to bear in mind that it's sitting in a dish full of a huge amount of volume. So, there's not much chance that the calcium that it's be released into the, um, into the fluid of the Petri dish is going to ever come back into it. Okay, so... Um, the endoplasmic reticulum is going to gradually deplete its calcium stores and that means that's why these calcium waves gradually lose their height because um, you're gradually going to end up releasing less and less calcium with each calcium wave so that's why um, the um, amplitude of the oscillation in calcium is going to go down and eventually it's going to disappear because the endoplasmic reticulum just empties Okay, uh, we'll continue this discussion in the next video.